Oh, first question I want to ask you, and I got this by watching a bunch of stuff last night, Dick Clark. I watched your first appearance on American Bandstand. And something that it told me, you still don't like to talk on camera, on television. That is not one of your favorite things to do, mm -hmm. is media. And Jeff Cook, God bless him, he did a lot of that for y'all and kept you from having to do it. But you're good at talking, so what is your reluctance to be on camera generally? The, the greatest thing I ever conquered was talking because I was extremely shy. Mm. I'll never will forget in Myrtle Beach one night, Teddy told me, he said, if you don't get in the middle of the microphone and start talking, we ain't never gonna mount that damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what, I took that to heart and so I put a, tried to put away the shyness and so bashful and uh, I didn't mind singing, but that wasn't really what I wanted to do. I really wanted to play my guitar. Mm -hmm. But then I ran into Jeff Cook, and he was a little bit better than I was. <laughs> and he told me he wanted to be the guitar player. So I changed everything about the way I played to hit big bar chords and uh, a big pick, mm. and how and where the, my sound would be all the strings hitting as opposed to picking or doing lead. So that was an adjustment, but we we had a good time to practice it because playing all the hours we did at the Bowery and playing all the clubs, we... I mean, y'all have so many parallels to the Beatles, and I'm sure you've been told that. It's a lot of parallels to the Beatles. They're, that's where they learned to be the Beatles is in the clubs. You learned to be Alabama in the clubs. True. So by the time you do get a record deal, uh, you're not really rookies. You're pretty polished. No, we we were ready. We didn't. I don't think we realized it, but we didn't care. We gonna play our music, and uh, as my daddy used to say, let the rough end drag. When was the first time you guys knew that you'd sort of become successful? Was there a point there? Because I know it's like saying <laughs> you're inside a tornado, and you're going down yeah. the road. You don't really know what house you hit. But at some point, did, when did you kind of look at you and say, ooh, we've kind of made it here? Was there a woo moment? Not. I tell you what, when we left Myrtle Beach, July the 12th, 1980, it was, it was just wide open. I mean, every, we did so many shows, went so many places, uh, getting invited to play here and, and playing there and, one of the things I remember, I mean, early on was Merle inviting us to play at Anaheim Stadium. Mm. And uh, I don't know, I know we had to fly, which was unusual for us. We, you know, we was used to riding in the van. We got there and we started playing and the uh, people in the stadium, the stadium went to rocking. Ooh. And they were like, don't be... <laughs> Whatever the, they're warning people not to be moving around on the stadium because the stadium was shop, jumping up and down, and uh, that's the first time I ever saw Willie Nelson. Mm. I didn't know who Willie was. I, I had no no clue, but I knew who Johnny Paycheck was. He was running the bases while Murrow was playing. I mean, he was wild. Mm. But that was one of the times that we kind of. Thought, you know, we, we're in California. This is Anaheim, California. That's we're at a stadium and we're playing with Merle Haggard. It was, a, it was a big deal. Don't you have to thank people like Willie and Waylon and Merle and really Johnny Paycheck, who were all kind of rough around the collar, oh. and you guys look rough around the collar, and that made you acceptable? Exactly. And, you know, Merle and Waylon were always overly friendly, not in a, in, a, in a good way. And we got to tell Merle that the first song we ever played live and, mm. and was Sing Me Back Home okay. at a high school. And I think that meant a lot to Merle. Uh, he was just, he was just so, such a great writer, always will be one of the greatest writer. To me, the best singer songwriter that's ever been. You know, every bar in Montgomery that I ever went into 
the bar band played Silver Wings. Yeah. You know, that was always a guarantee that people going to dance. Yeah. You know, I don't think Merle really never, I don't know if he cared, but he didn't really know how big he was or how important he was or how much his music was I think really there was great. a parallel sort of, I knew both the guys pretty good between Dale Earnhardt and Merle Haggard. Mm -hmm. They never really spent time thinking about how great they yeah. were. Yeah. And people just loved them. Yeah. Because they were kind of nonchalant about, you know, Dale was the best driver and Murrow was the best songer, singer songwriter. Well, let's talk about this June Jam that's back again. Uh, what does that event mean to you? It means a lot. It means a lot. It, it, what I'm just thankful that we're here to do another June <laughs> Jam. <laughs> I mean, it's it's like. Uh, I know our wishes are that we would love to see it continue long after we're gone. I think with Jeff's passing, for me, and I speak personally for me, the things that we worked out together and worked so hard for, we would love to see that continue for the city and the county and the mm -hmm. state and, and really for artists, singers and, and performers that they can come and you know, have uh, younger people come in or whatever and keep it something that's like we created, you know, many years ago. It's more than a concert. I mean, it's really a week of events. It's more like some type of homecoming, right? That's why it, it should be. It should be like a homecoming, a happy time. Uh, this time, I mean, there's more people wants to come than we got slots <laughs> for. And that was... That, that's a good thing. Because everybody has been at this thing. I was the, the only I've been once. It was insane. Billy Ray Cyrus was on fire. Oh, man. And uh, I thought the women were going to eat him. Well, I was scared for him. I mean, it was, it was, I, I'd never seen Beatlemania. I wasn't old enough, but it was close to Beatlemania. Yeah, it, it Billy was, Ray Cyrus mania. That was great. That yeah, was great. That's cool. That's, that's fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I know you don't live your life in a rearview mirror, but when you're in this room, you got to a little bit. I was mentioning Dick Clark. You always had a great relationship with Dick Clark, and yeah. you guys always did so well on American Music Awards, and he really treated you guys right. He Ralph Henry and Dick Clark, probably two of your greatest fans. He told me something I'll never forget. I can't say it. <laughs> but to paraphrase, he said, you guys are always on time. Hmm. And so I asked him, I said, what, what do you attribute, I mean, all this stuff that, that you've been so successful? He said, I always, I always say thank you. Hmm. And I never forgot that. Hmm. I always remembered to say thank you. And yeah, between him and Gene Weed and Bill Boyd, we had a great relationship. And, and it, it was just that, uh, me and Mo Bandy we were talking about this the other night on the, the cruise ship. The, uh, we opened for Mo at uh, Disney, is it Disney World or Disneyland in California? Disneyland. Okay, we opened for him and we had a friendship for all these years. I guess it's in 80. And uh, Mo was staying in a nice motel. We were staying <laughs> in a not so nice motel. But you know, you remember the good times and the good people. And I never will forget one of my favorite memories is playing golf with Glenn Campbell, Bill Boyd, and Gene mm -hmm. Weed. Because Glenn was a great golfer. Mm -hmm. And the rest of us were just out there, you know, players. <laughs> <laughs> Glenn was a lot of, I, I got to spend some time with him, and he was, I really liked him. And uh, that was rough watching him. Well, he was another person that was so kind to us. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you know, and I'd seen him on TV, you know, the Glenn Campbell Good Time Hour, and I was, thought he might be kind of hard to know, and he was just open. Because mm -hmm. I used him on a couple of different shows, and he was he was easy to work with. And he was also, producible, which is not, not always the case. And he's me. also very good. Yes, he was great. <laughs> <laughs> but he was producible. If you ask him to do this, if you, he, could, he could bend. He wasn't like some stick in the mud. Uh, if you remember the Glenn Campbell on, and Dick Clark and Gene Weed and Bill mm -hmm. Boyd did a lot of stuff, just like we did with them. Yeah. One of the first calls they'd make is see if Glenn was open or see if mm -hmm. we was open. 
I look at, I, I try to remember all these songs and uh, I don't know that you can either, you know, <laughs> all the words no. to them because it's ridiculous. It's a number, a lot, a lot of numbers of songs, but how did you, what was the secret sauce into being able to have a mountain music and take me down? I mean, what was the secret sauce in all these songs? Who was the, you know, who, who recognized those as hits? All a little of bit us. of everybody? All of us. You know, I never sang anything I didn't like except one or two. And they were huge hits. So I learned to love them. And I never forget Teddy brought me a song. And I told him, I said, well, it's not my kind of song, but I'm not stupid enough not to record it. <laughs> and it was, uh, you know, uh, uh, jukebox in my mind, mm -hmm. which was number one for longer than any single that we ever had. So I, you know, the thing that was so magical to me about the, what we did was once I'd lay it down, I did the vocals live and I didn't realize I was pissing everybody off because yeah. now and then, you know, you're going to do the track and come back and sing to it. But I did them live and I'd stop when I messed up or whatever. And, and when and Jeff and Teddy got a hold of it, Teddy would, and both of them would just geniuses at laying down harmonies. Mm. Some harmonies they would do where they did one track, sometimes they did two, sometimes then I'd come in and double them on some of the tracks. But what we always did is we'd go out and try those babies out on hmm. a live audience. And I remember that we uh, did Roll On in Reunion Arena in Dallas, had never recorded it. Hmm. And we told the folks, we got truck driving songs. And we worked that song up on the bus, went out and played it live. And that's how tight we were. And it turned out great, of course. Still does. I mean, I watched that when y'all were playing Peanut Festival or something, whatever we were there. I was at and I was at a concert with you. And that audience from these little kids to these old people, they lit up during that song. Yeah, and right. I, what that, I mean, I think it's a good song. Yeah. But it, it really gets people. Well, you know, up. I told Dave Loggins, he'd, he'd written some songs for us. And I told him, I said, I'm looking for a truck driving mm. song. And I don't want this song about trucks. I want it to have a meaning to it. So he called me about three or four o'clock in the morning, <laughs> as he did from time to time. He probably don't remember it, but he's like, oh, man, I man, I got a truck driving song. What's it called? Roll on. Well, that's a good title. So he got to sing, singing a song with just him and his guitar. But you know, we took that song, uh, spent hours and hours and hours recording the CB radio, the, the bus driver talking on the CB radio, a <laughs> real bus driver. Mm -hmm. We recorded it. And it was freezing and popping in Nashville, and the limbs were breaking, falling off the trees. We had the bus parked out in front of the old, the new music mill. And there were people coming by looking at us like, those people are messed up. Because <laughs> we, had, we had a big microphone out there recording the tailpipe of the bus really? as it took off, you know. All that was, we felt was necessary. Of course, it, you never hear it on the radio, yeah. but that we felt like that was important stuff. And then we kept on trying to get this Buddy McKenzie, this bus driver say, how about you Alabama, roll on. He like, huh? <laughs> Can you not say, how about you Alabama, roll on? Is that all you want me to say? That's all we want you to say. But we want you to say it in the CB. So we record the CB through the window of the bus. All right. Hey, how about you, Alabama? <laughs> Can you be a little bit more enthusiastic? Little enthusiastic. <laughs> uh, speaking of that, I got a great clip of, uh, I, I love it every time you sing it, but this was on a Gaither show, and it was Angels Among Us, and that is your song. And I know how hard it was to get recorded with uh, some of the executives with the record label and all that stuff. Yeah. But that song is one of those songs that's, that's kind of had a life of its own now. Absolutely. And, uh, 
does it get to you every time you sing it? Because I does. your eyes and, it does. and I could tell you have to go to a different place to sing that song. I have to go and sometimes I get choked up. But the thing that chokes you up is if you ever look at the people. Yeah, you can't do that. <laughs> they are, you have people who are so emotional people you're looking at who you never think you're getting and then you look at them it's like oh my lord come back to me yeah you know let me go ahead i knew that song was going to be special i had just picked the song once upon a lifetime for the first song on the next album and i was sitting in a room there in uh, los angeles and I didn't answer the phone, cause I, but I listened to the message. And the message was in Spanish. And it was uh, that, how much they love the angel song. Yeah. I knew then that there was a chord there that had been struck. It was beyond whatever record executives. Mm -hmm. They had no idea. No. What we went by was what the people thought about it. I'll never forget being in Phoenix, Arizona, and we were fixed to go on stage, which is a bad time to be talking to me. But uh, this guy told me, he said, are you gonna play that damn angel song? And I said, yeah. And he said, we'll never play it. So when we went out to play it, like 15,000 people, lighters lit up. I yeah. thought, somewhere they heard it. Maybe they didn't hear it, but they like it. So it did, it took on a life of its own. And I'm very thankful. That yeah, it's raised a lot of money. Okay. I think so. Just that song has raised a lot of money. It's, it's like the theme song at St. Yeah, Jude. Yeah, Jude. I think it is, too. And, you know, everybody's got their favorites. I, I always like I'm in a hurry. As a radio guy, I just like the song. It's just, well, it's, it's just a ditty, but it's this great, fun little video and all that stuff. Tell me about this museum. Um, I know the fans come in here, but you got to come in here and just your mind goes crazy, yeah. doesn't it? Looking at these things, looking at these people that are frozen in time. Well, I mean, fans I know love this. They gotta just eat this up with a spoon. The sad thing, the sad stuff about it, and you know, there's yeah. T. T. Wayne Robertson with well, I see uh, Conway over there. There's Conway, Conway Twitty, of course, my friend Conway. I love Conway. Me too. He uh, he called me. One afternoon, he's like, is this Randy? I was like, yeah, Conway Twitty. Like, oh, my God, Conway Twitty. And I bet he's and, calling you to say, I got a song. No, no. He, he, was, he no, would do that, too. I know, but he said, uh, Randy, I'm calling you about that song you wrote called Lady Down on Love. Oh. You wrote that song. And I said, yeah, I did. And he said, well, I was going to record it. I said, Conway, that's going to be Alabama's next single. And he said, oh, I was afraid of that. <laughs> so that's we talked. Conway, that's a Conway Twitty song, though. Oh, man, he could have tore it up. I said, well, you can go ahead and do it. I'd love for you to. But, you know, wasn't meant to be. But I, I got, a lot of times I listen to, you know, Conway knew what hits were. Oh, yeah. He could pick a hit and he could sing one. He's underappreciated by the establishment up there too. Oh. Big time. It makes me crazy because he was, he was, so they used to say he was the best friend a song ever had. And it takes a lot after you get to be a jaded news person for a while. But if I was at one of his shows, uh, two of my big moments, I got to hold the microphone before he came out one and he would come out in the dark and he took the microphone, people do this everywhere. That was a big deal. I thought I was really cool having to do that. And then I'd always come out from the back of the show to watch Pork Chop and him do Redneck and Love Making Night. I <laughs> love that song. And uh, that was so unlike Conway to do an up-tempo song yeah, like that. Yeah. But it was just, you know, it's just all these people, you have different memories. He always liked to dress like, he couldn't wait to get back in his sweatpants right. on the bus. He couldn't get in that sweat clothes fast enough after he'd been out there on this. Merle stage. did some shows with us years go by and I never forget he'd, he'd wear sweatpants and his boots <laughs> and come backstage and tell us all kind of stories. I and bet. It was so much fun to listen to him tell about, you know, stuff and see him smile. Mm -hmm. 
He enjoyed it. Yeah, it's uh, it's fun. You know, you can't live on memory lane, but I'm sure glad I took pictures. And I'm glad, uh, I wish I had more pictures of stuff. I got a picture of you with your head cut off. Well, Some I, idiot took in the I opera. Tell you, it's your head's cut off and Minnie Pearl's head's cut off. And we're taking the three shot together. Uh, but it's just, you know, what are you going to do with people who can't get George it? George Jones told me something one time I never will forget. He said, Randy, I knew Elvis. He went on to Hank Williams. Mm -hmm. I think he said Hank Williams. He went off naming all these legendary. Mm -hmm. And he said, I don't have one picture of me and them together. I thought, that's awful. How could nobody, you know, you're not thinking in the moment. Luckily, there were people around us taking pictures yeah. from time to time. But they still pictures I'd love to have. Oh, me too. Uh, me too. People that we're friends with. and They're just people you've worked with and people that turned out it to be. It reminds you so much of how lucky you've been, how fortunate yeah, how you've been, and how blessed. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I had that luck with all these Hollywood people I dealt with all over. You would see a younger Stallone and me with brown hair. And you've kept your hair, which is a miracle. <laughs> yeah, I got a lot of hair. So you, you've done good with that. But it's, you know, you and, the, and some of these looks up there, it's, it's great. It's great. All right, so I've talked about the museum. This is a great place to come if you love Alabama. And June Jam is going to be fun, hopefully forever. And it's going to be great this year. Jake Owen and the Oak Ridge Boys and Neil McCoy and all those fun people. And let's do this real before we go. I know that at noon on June the 3rd, that Saturday, is the public memorial for Jeff Cook. And, uh, you know, I don't even know. It, it, Jeff, you can't say what he means to you. No. But because it's too much. And if you maybe wouldn't even be in Alabama, probably. That's right. Uh, if it wasn't for Jeff. But, uh, <laughs> well, Jeff gave he up. Makes, I, but the thing about him, and, and it, I don't know what I think of. I have to think about that when I think of you. Jeff makes me laugh. He always made me laugh. He was. He was a fun sort of guy. He would love that. I know he wouldn't have. I know he wouldn't have. I don't know if that's. I know I liked his. Guy. He was fun. I mean, I liked yeah, to talk to him. He loved to tell funny stuff. Yeah. Me and him had a good time with old Roadhog. Mm-hmm. The Stanley yeah. Brothers yeah. tapes. We'd listen to those on the road, and he loved that. And Andy Griffith. Yeah. You know, he would. Uh, but he would Hogan's drive down the road. He would drive down the road on the way to Panama City or wherever he was going. And I was doing oldie radio. I'd come back and do oldies radios in Montgomery sometimes. And he'd be right. He'd call. He'd make a request, you know, for something he wanted to hear. And uh, and it was just, I mean, he was just, uh, he was a little unpredictable. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't you say? <laughs> yeah. But it was a good unpredictable. Give me, let's see, give me five adjectives that would describe Jeff Cook. <laughs> unpredictable. Unpredictable. Quick, mm -hmm. fast, uh, extremely talented. That's two words. Uh, he didn't care. He cared more. He loved music. He would play with anybody. Mm -hmm. It didn't matter what it was. He could jump up and jam with people. And the other thing was with... Uh, He's just his love and enthusiasm for music, just mm -hmm. music in general. And he loved the tape. He loved oldies. Mm -hmm. And me and Teddy get so irritated at him sometimes. He said, that was on a blue label. Yep, I can do that. And, you know, and a 45. Spiral Staircase, red label, Columbia yeah, Records. Yeah, up to, yeah. Spiral. I have that wrong I thing. I love you more <laughs> today than yesterday. But not as much as tomorrow. Yeah. I love those. He knew all those. I know. <laughs> he knew all the oldies. You know, the other thing, too, is he loved radio. I used to go on yes. Sunday morning in Myrtle Beach. He had a job after all the stuff we did, working all the time, and he would go to and be a DJ on Sunday morning at a local country radio station. And, you know, we were trying to figure out how to wake up. <laughs> but I'd go down sometimes and hang out with him because we could play whatever we mm -hmm. wanted to play at that time on Sunday morning. Sometimes the manager would call and say, who's in that studio with you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I know that, the, you know, this. I, I don't see how you, I don't see how anybody has a career like this, uh, knowing what it takes to get there. 
And uh, I know you've got to be amazed at it. And I know you hated it sometimes. And I uh, was tired of it and didn't want to think about it. But at the end of the day, uh, you got to pat yourself on the back and say, hey, you know, I'm a survivor in this business and still, and still can play in the major league. It's amazing. Yeah, it's kind of like, uh, you know, the first few shows we did when we left Myrtle Beach, we would look at one another and like, there's thousands of people out here. Yeah. And uh, I told my manager at that time, I said, we pulled into Milwaukee. And uh, at that time, I had the name of the bus, you know, the name on mm -hmm. the side of the bus, all yeah. that kind of stuff. People went to cheer, and I said, uh, are all those people there to see us? Mm -hmm. He said, yes, every one of them, and they will be unless you screw it up. <laughs> and I told him, I said, I don't intend on screwing it up. And I, so that's been almost, ooh, since 80. Been a long time. Long time. Real quick, this is a, a, a Randy Owenism. You said it, and I've seen that too. You go into some kind of weird zone, uh, 30 minutes before a show? Yeah. Is it 30 minutes or an hour or what is it? An hour. An hour, you go into some space, don't mess with me. Uh, what is it, do you, do you become Randy Owen, the singer at that point and not the farmer or what is it you do? Uh, well, I'm trying to remember what I'm supposed to do <laughs> and where I am. Yeah. I want to make sure they know you're not, that not I- in Pittsburgh, but you're in Cincinnati. I appreciate where we are. Mm -hmm. And remember if there's anything that's happened in years gone by that mm -hmm. was special. I try to remember if I got a letter or a correspondence from some fan or whatever that somebody was sick or that somebody uh, loved the song they wanted to hear. And so I'm not past doing uh, localizing a show. Okay. Making it local as opposed to just doing- You're doing this by yourself? Yeah. Usually, okay. Well, yeah, because a lot of the stuff I do is on the spur of the moment. And it's all about me. It's, it takes you to a thing of fun as opposed to rigid. Yeah. I don't care about if they want to hear something rigid, put on the CD or whatever and listen <laughs> mm -hmm. to it. It's perfect every time. I won't be. I don't try to be. I try to have fun and try to relate to that guy sitting out there that got up at six o'clock this morning or yesterday morning and worked till six drove his pickup mm -hmm. truck back home, loved his wife and his children and gets up and works and does it again. If they do that, more than likely they're an Alabama fan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of them out there. I was looking at the last thing I just remembered, I was supposed to tell you hello from Doug Paisley, Brad's dad, and uh, cause he's one of my best friends. Yes, and Brad just got back from Ukraine about two hours ago. And uh, I know that video is cool. And he uses it in his show, Old Alabama. Um, that was a funny story. Tell me about that. <laughs> From my? Yeah. Okay. Well, he was kind of nervous about telling me about this, mm -hmm. what I would think about it. Mm -hmm. And he said, and we kind of, we, we copied you and, and uh, got on your copyright. I said, What's the name of the song? He's like, Old Alabama. It's like, really? He's like, that, does, that, does that bother you, like, Old Alabama? I'm like, no. So he's talking about the licks on the guitars. I said, Brad, I have that guitar. I, I played all the hits with that guitar. And he's like, no way. And I said, yeah. He said, well, I can do it. I, I can do the licks. I said, okay, I said, but anyway, I said, uh, I've got the guitar. So when I took the Music Man guitar that I played, I hit it and he said, that's the guitar. I said, <laughs> I told you I had the guitar. So then Jeff went back in and Teddy and so we, you know, the thing I appreciate about Brad is what he's meant to me with the kids at St. Jude. Yeah. He does it quietly. And also what he did for the tornado thing that we did in Birmingham. Mm -hmm. That was his stage that he furnished, which cost thousands of dollars. And out of the goodness of his heart, he did that. I'll never forget it. 